Good afternoon. And we now move to the, uh, some of the energy debates which we have been trying to uh, have behind uh, the, uh, the, uh, during the conference. And what we're trying to do today is to have a, a little discussion about some of the uh, shale gas, uh, LNG and energy market issues which affect uh, Europe uh, and particularly uh, this part of the world. So we've got a good team uh, to talk about this. Uh, we've, got, we've got Peter, who is one of the uh, top U.S. Uh, business executives in the uh, oil and gas industry. He works for Baker Hughes. And for any of you who don't know, know about Baker Hughes, they are one of the chief technological uh, energy companies uh, in the world. If you want to know the rig count of shale gas drilling in the United States, download the Baker Hughes app. It's on my iPad. Very good. Uh, it's very, very useful. Uh, so I, Peter is going to take a part in this. So it's Mikhail. Now Mikhail is one of the really um, deep thinking and uh, powerfully formulated uh, energy thinkers in Russia. Uh, I only wish Vladimir Putin would listen to him more. Uh, sadly, this doesn't, uh, d doesn't happen, but hopefully uh, a chaste Mr. Putin may listen to him more in the future. Now, without further ado, I think we're going to try and move and talk a little about some of the issues here. Uh, I think what I'm going to start with is a question to Mikhail simply about, uh, about the, the impact of uh, what's happened with Ukraine uh, on uh, European energy security. And I think the first question really is, uh, do you think that Vladimir Putin is on his way to becoming the dark father of European shale gas? Uh, well, if you uh, mean the transatlantic relation of the shale revolution uh, in the United States, for example, and the impact of that shale revolution on the market of gas in Europe, which is vitally important for Russia and for Mr. Putin as well, who is the godfather of Gazprom, I would say, yeah. um, then I think there are some issues that need to be addressed. Just a few days ago, a member of the uh, one of the commissioners in the energy com in the European Commission uh, asked publicly the United States to uh, supply shale gas to Europe in order to decrease dependence of the Europeans on the Russian gas. I doubt it is possible. I doubt that uh, the guy understands the arithmetic of the business. First, there are no uh, facilities of producing shale, uh, liquefied natural gas in the United States to export it to anywhere. Just the first plant is being built now. And some of the companies are expecting permission to do that. Uh, and uh, secondly, the prices in Europe, the price of gas is about twice the price, uh, uh, about 50 percent or 60 percent of the price of liquefied natural gas in the uh, Pacific region, where Japan and uh, China are the main consumers. So it's impossible just, uh, maybe he was under the impression that uh, Mr. Obama can invite CEOs of uh, oil and gas companies into the uh, White House and tell them to sell gas, which does not exist yet, to uh, uh, Europe instead of Asia at uh, half of the price. I don't think it is possible. It could be possible in a communist country like the Soviet Union, where the government or the Communist Party in issued instructions to the gas and oil producers where to sell gas, how to supply that gas. It's impossible. So I think some of the guys in the European Commission just do not understand what is going on. And vice versa, in Russia, there are some experts who believe that uh, the main idea of the Ukrainian events was to undermine Russia's uh, positions on the Euro European energy market as a the gas supplier and to replace that with shale gas from the United States. Another absolutely impossible uh, thing to imagine, but well, uh, experts are experts and propaganda is propaganda. So I don't think this is uh, the real perspective. Uh, the shale gas uh, revolution in the United States is making an impact on the market in Europe, uh, but this is not a direct uh, impact because the prices are going down because uh, the United States buys less 
gas because it produces a lot of shale gas of its own. And the prices are decreasing. LNG. Yes, be, be, because other producers are not uh, are switching from the United States to other markets, to Japanese market, to European market, and so on. But to expect some shale gas from the United States, you will need to take, well, maybe in two years, according, according to my uh, calculations, Peter uh, disagrees with me. I believe in exactly two years, uh, the United States will be able to export about 18 million tons, metric tons of LNG, but most of that will go to Asia, not, but not to Europe. So when we, you speak about the energy security in Europe, don't hope to get any shale gas, any significant amount of shale gas from uh, Northern America. Okay. So what let, you, let me just clarify you, what we disagree on. We yeah, only yeah, disagree yeah, on, yeah. we don't agree, disagree on uh, the ultimate outcome. I think we agree on the pace of uh, export shipments. So 18 is close enough probably in two years' time, but uh, there's probably a bit in an ass spread of how much we can deliver by 2018, and I think Mikhail is more optimistic than I am yes. on permitting and getting these projects underway and getting them constructed and getting first flow of, of liquefied natural gas out of the country. Yeah. I mean, one of the issues about uh, LNG uh, and the issue about how much, I mean, there are issues about scale, how much would be available, um, right. given the licensing and permitting systems and so forth, and also the, the sense that if we put the capital in, are we going to make the return on this? Uh, so obviously this expectation that this will work commercially. Uh, and then, of course, the issue is sort of timing, how long uh, right. uh, 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 will this all take? And I suppose the third issue, which I suppose we've got to think about, is when we should raise is where will the gas go? And clearly, President Obama can't direct. But if you have a situation where there is more liquidity coming into the Asian markets from other sources, from Australia, uh, from Papua New Guinea, from Exxon's new facility there, and so forth, uh, and we have some falling Chinese uh, growth, so no longer at seven or eight, more at four or five percent, does that have the effect of reducing Asia's prices sufficiently to make Europe more attractive? I don't think you necessarily have to trade one against the other as long as the economics into Europe are sufficient to justify building facilities in the U.S. or mm -hmm. wherever else, or Canada for that matter. Sure, the margins for LNG producers are higher in Asia because the price is higher and the mm -hmm. delivered cost is maybe a dollar or two more, but the price is seven dollars more. So Asia is always the first port of call for LNG and that's why most of the contracts are signed with Asian customers. Uh, but as long as you have a viable um, long-term price in Europe that covers your cost to deliver plus a return on the capital, you'll find plenty of supply coming out of the U.S. because there's plenty of supply in the U.S. that's looking for a home. And if we can get a decent return in Europe, we'll do it. And uh, in Japan just is, is a more attractive market, generally speaking, but Europe's, Europe's a fine destination. Doesn't also part of this is about uh, the the sheer resource base of the United States. I mean, every time you, the the potential gas committee uh, issues right. new figures, they're they're always upward, uh, and you have you know the exploration and development of new shales. The technology which is being uh, developed is moving at such a pace that fields which were marginally productive and profitable two or three years ago are now substantially more productive and profitable. And so there's just so much more gas right. available. That, but so it creates its own impetus to export, I suppose. Well, uh, let me describe the landscape uh, a little bit in more detail. The world is short LNG, okay, yeah. generally speaking. Maybe, you know, from time to time we have a little bit of excess, depends on, you know, what's happening with, with mm -hmm weather and a few other things um, and, and industrial production. But we think, I think it's going to be short LNG for, the, for the, let's say, the next four or five years, okay, mm -hmm. because demand in Asia is growing. We think about 6 percent. At least my uh, uh, studies show that. Um, but what's totally ironic, um, and it still boggles my mind, when I joined Baker Hughes nine years ago, mm -hmm. we had 1,600 rigs drilling for gas and 300 rigs drilling for oil. You know what we have today? 300 rigs drilling for gas and 1,600 rigs drilling for oil. We're basically not drilling gas today because the price is so low. So worldwide demand's going up. We're not even drilling for gas. It's, it, it, so what's in the way? Well, we have to get contracts signed. We need, we need government involvement. We need to get permits out. 
But this is a fantastic, I think, market over the next 10 years because we have so much gas, we don't know what to do with it. We're not even drilling it today because we lose money when we drill for gas. And we got the world market that needs gas. And so I think it's going to be tremendous development. I think it's good for Trans-Pacific, Transatlantic development. And it's, I, I think it's a great business to be in. Mm -hmm. um, but we just need to get the roadblocks out of the way and get the permits through. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's a great energy source and uh, it's, it's, there's plenty of it. And that's not just in the US, by the way. It's, it's in various places in, on this continent, too. That's really interesting. Well, what actually turns is actually perhaps a bit back to Europe. Um, if the Europeans, Mikhail, actually get round to, uh, because of the, 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 uh, the, the uh, political crisis, they decide to go for shale gas. For example, if some member states decide to turn their shale plays into energy security zones and they create a much more um, streamlined procedural system to actually get uh, the shale gas going, that sort of reaction, what do you think uh, the, the Kremlin and the Gazprom reaction would be to that sort of development? That's some sort of an ideal case if you eliminate all the obstacles to shale gas uh, production in Europe, and I don't believe it is going to happen anytime soon. Well, basically, yes, I think uh, the scenario would be just like uh, President Putin described it when he met foreign investors in the city of Salihard in 2009. He said, if you do not like the terms of our gas sales in Europe, we are going to liquefy all our gas and to sell it to Northern America. After that, North America was not, uh, well, was moving in the wrong direction yeah. and uh, lo uh, Russia was losing that market uh, and the ideas of that market. Instead, the Russian uh, government uh, officials and Gazprom officials started saying that in a few years we'll start exporting as much gas to Asia as we are exporting now to Europe. That's impossible. Maybe they just missed their uh, arithmetic lessons in, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in school because uh, basically the largest amount of gas they can sell in Europe, just as Mr. Putin uh, used to say, is 68 uh, billion cubic meters a year. They were selling in Western Europe last year 138 billion cubic meters. So if they believe what they are saying, it would mean, uh, it would mean they are going to cut in half the supply to Europe <laughs> to punish the Europeans by cutting the supply of gas instead of increasing the supply of gas to China and other Asian nations. So please do not listen to what the officials say, just count the arithmetics, how much gas they can sell, how much uh, the ga this gas is going to cost, because right now in Russia the cost of gas production and gas transportation is soaring. Mm. And I am afraid that uh, some uh, consignments of gas uh, Russia is selling in Europe are sold below production and transportation costs. Wow, that's quite, a, that is quite amazing. So that would actually suggest they, are, they, they have a difficulty in reacting. If the Europeans actually produced, started producing substantial amounts of shale gas, well, it's not just shale gas. If you take a look at the prices of gas on the spot market in Europe, uh, some hubs such as NBP hub in the United Kingdom or mm -hmm. TTF in the, in the Netherlands or the Baumgarten uh, hub in Austria, you would see that in the summer the average price was 250 to 170 dollars per 1,000 cubic meters. Mm -hmm. Right now it is 320, something like that, yeah. 340. It is already at the edge of uh, commercial viability of Russian gas supply. Because Russian gas has to travel 5,000 kilometers from Yamburg, from the main point in, the, in mm. Western Siberia, 5,070 mm. kilometers to the to Baumgarten distribution hub in Austria. And each kilometer takes some gas for, uh, Fuel. Uh, yeah, yeah, feed gas for uh, compressors. Yeah. And some gas is lost and you have to maintain all that pipelines and it is a costly business to transport that gas. And you have to find new sources of gas in addition to those old fields of the Soviet area, which was easy to, they were easy to develop because it was pure methane 
no need to purify it to take any components from that gas. And the pressure was good. Now they have to uh, uh, put on, uh, to install additional compressors to increase the pressure of that gas. And the fields are being, the reservoirs all the res are being depleted. And they have to find new gas somewhere 5,000 miles, uh, 500 miles from the old field. They have to build new infrastructure to deliver it. It's a it's costly business. And it is not because uh, Gazprom is too greedy. They want a higher price for that. That's because the production and transportation costs are growing. But that suggests that if we have a substantial amount of shale gas production in Europe, that would create a significant problem for Russian gas. Yes, yes, it will be. It, it is already a problem. When the Russia is planning to switch to the east, to switch all the flows, first, uh, right now it is impossible. When they are developing uh, new fields in Yakutia or in eastern Siberia, they are not connected with the network that delivers gas to Europe. But Mr. Putin announced in September, on the 1st of September, they are going to connect those non-existing yet eastern uh, grids of uh, pipelines with the Western grids. And then he is very hopeful that Russia will be able to switch from Europe to Asia and backwards if the market situation is suitable uh, in some of the regions. Well, uh, I don't think this is, uh, th this is a very simplified thinking because, well, uh, the cost of Russian gas in Asia on the Asian market is not commercial vi viable. You know, if you uh, have the Vladivostok LNG project on the yeah. Pacific coast, for example, the cost of gas from Sakhalin in Vladivostok yeah. plant is going to be between 10 or 11 dollars per 1 million uh, British thermal units at the entrance of the plant. You have to add liquefaction costs, uh, freight, storage, uh, insurance, and regasification in Japan, for example. Yeah. And the price is going to be it is not going to be competitive even in comparison with the Australian gas. That's okay. So that's very interesting. So the question now is, is if we were to say establish energy security zones, uh, we create a robust but swift procedures for, for implementation of shale gas, um, how fast could we actually go for it? How, could we, how quickly could we get to commercial production um, <sighs> if we created a series of, of energy security zones? Well, before I get to the speculation on how fast, let's just say that energy security ought to start at home. Yeah. Uh, because if it's at home and you, you think you have the resource, you control the investment, you control the um, permitting, you put in good environmental standards that you know, are good for your country, you create jobs, and uh, your gas is always going to be cheaper than imported from somebody else who has to do all of the same thing, plus mark it up, plus transport it. So that's where it should start. Um, it shouldn't start thinking about LNG imports as your energy policy, whether it's imports from one continent or imports from another continent. It, it needs to start you know, at home. But once you've established that, and if you have the good geology, and the geology is a question mark still in Europe, we don't know exactly the product. We know, we know we have a lot of resource in place, both gas and oil across Europe. It's a question of whether or not you can produce it economically. So we're starting to do that in places like Poland uh, and Romania. In fact, if you look at the rig count, uh, you mentioned the rig count earlier, mm -hmm. earlier. In all of Europe, there are, you know, I mentioned that there are 1,900 rigs in the United States today. In all of Europe, there are 55 rigs today. My figure is 72, but you're more, <laughs> and we, yeah, more we pessimistic. Have, we, have, we have a specialized rig count, but anyway, yes. we can argue about that. And the, the, the largest number of rigs in Europe right now, 12 in Romania, mm -hmm. the next down is seven in Poland, and the rest are all single digits. So uh, to the time it takes to ramp up, uh, I'll use an example. In the Bakken field, big oil field in North Dakota, uh, probably took us five or six years to get w to where we are today. And we're now producing one million barrels a day out of the Bakken field. It took us six years to get there, it was, it was remote, Maybe that's an advantage, mm -hmm. um, but we have the infrastructure in place in the United States where we can build rigs and build tools, everything um, that needs that is required to develop that field. So five or six years, you're, you've got a world-class oil field. Can you achieve? You're probably going to be slower in Europe because you don't have the same infrastructure here. You're going to have opposition from all all sides. Uh, we don't know about the geology, but. That's the pessimistic side. If you really, and the original question was if all obstacles were gone, well, yeah, we could do this. There's no reason because we drill all over, all over the world. 
We are nomadic. We can put rigs wherever we need to, whether it's in the ocean or on land, we can, we can get them built. It's just a matter of time, but you could get to first production in a year or two, and then you could ramp up over the next five or six years. Well, that's a very hopeful note on which to, to, to end. So I suppose the message to uh, the policymakers of the conference is, if needs must, we could actually do things fairly quickly. It is not entirely pessimistic. There are things that can be done. I'd like to thank Mikhail and Peter for a very interesting debate and discussion, and no doubt we'll continue this throughout the conference. Thank you very much.